So welcome to the uh, another of our webinars here, this on the investment side. And we got, again, the, the night folks, folks, PARS, uh, Public Agency Retirement Systems, and U.S. Bank to kind of tell us what's going on in the OPEP space. I'll give you a quick overview of healthcare. So with that, I will share a screen here and helps if I hit the right button. And yeah, I will do that real quickly. And I share the proper screen. And, and uh, let's see here, I go to the actual world. All right. All right, so I'm just gonna do a quick overview of what's going on in the healthcare side. So with COVID-19, healthcare is spending down quite a bit. If you take out the COVID-19 part, about 40% on personal consumption which seems insane. Emergency room visits down 42%. Insurance carriers, and the odd thing you'll notice is they're actually covering things they wouldn't otherwise normally cover because they're obligated to spend a certain amount of money. Hence why Anthem is offering 10 to 15% credits on your July invoice. Not everywhere, but it's in certain places. So you're gonna see some definite savings in the short run. Longer term, I would expect healthcare costs to come back to normal, but in the short run, significantly down. I'll share a couple of charts to show that. So as you can see, surgical down 37, you know, is maximum 37 percent of your spending. Maternity is about 20 percent. But when you see what happens is, you know, again, a giant cliff. Dental down 61 percent year over year. Physician services 45. Hospitals down 41. So major, major declines in healthcare spending year over year. I mean, yes, nursing homes and prescription drugs are up, but prescription drugs are seemingly always up. Um, but again, as you can see from the CVS study, utilization everywhere, overall down 30, inpatient, outpatient, physicians, it doesn't matter. Everything's way down. Um, for the key things you guys care about, discount rates. Last year when we did fiscal 19, they're about 279. Now we're at about 263. Um, the long-term rate of return, it's a building block approach. These guys will talk to you a little bit about how they invest and how we make that building block happen by the various asset classes. Generally, we'll see those being five and a half and 7%, depending on how you're investing. Um, and again, the single equivalent discount rate, it's a blend. If you fund a lot, you get to use the long-term rate. If you fund nothing, you'll be at the S&P muni bond rate. And if you fund a little bit, you'll be in between. For last year, um, Sarah on our team puts together a, a statistics, basically we rank all the clients. Our 50th percentile discount rate last year was four and a quarter, which is the same as the prior year. It did go up on the 75th percentile from about five and a half up to six, as more people are definitely funding and funding more. Um, so again, unlike what we saw here this morning, we did a recent study, found about 60% of our clients expected to reduce OPEB funding in 2021. Um, but that's, listen, right now, until we know what's going on with COVID, the Fed, Congress, how much money they're gonna give in state and local aid, if any, I think everything right now is kind of a, we don't know. Um, so we will see. The key thing I guess I would tell you is if you do happen to reduce things in 2021, if it's a one-off and you have a commitment to restore it in some future year, say we're going to take off 2021 or reduce it by say $100,000 and we're going to make that back in 2022 through 2025, the auditors in the rating agency community will probably view it fine, at least in the auditors I've spoken with. Um, on the other hand, if you say, ah, we're just going to stop this, we don't have time anymore, well, that would be a change in funding policy and would definitely negatively impact your discount rate. And more importantly, forgetting about discount rate for a second is, it will not be viewed favorably with the rating agencies because ultimately the cost of your plan is the benefits we just spoke about. That's what really does things. All this actuarial assumption stuff, and I'm an actuary, despite the lack of recent haircuts that make it look like an 80s cover band, really actually am an actuary. Um, benefit payments would drive all this. And so that's how we gotta really manage. But the stuff they can do on the funding side you know, what Kate and her team and Dennis, what they're gonna do is show you how to pay for it in a way, hopefully as cheaply as possible. We also have this thing we call post-pension funding. Work with a lot of our clients on that. If you're not currently doing it, at some point in time, 2035, 2038, whenever, your pension system should be fully funded. At least that's the theory. Those funds become available to use for other things. The argument we make with all of our clients, and I know many of you are on the line, is, to deploy those funds into OPEB, at least make that your formal policy. It can always change later. But the thing is, if you don't basically put in a request for those funds now, somebody else will. So better off to get that request in now. And the key thing here is, as an actuary, I'm allowed to 
assume that those contributions will actually come, which therefore from a funding policy standpoint means I get to use that long-term rate of return that Kate and Dennis and their team do, which leads to a higher discount rate. You're looked more favorably by the rating agencies. And ultimately, you're gonna have a much better looking financial statement. So again, OPEB funding, these are the stats that we do. 12% of people we found were not funding. Um, about, you know, about 85% were less than 20%. So 15% or at least 20% funded. Um, but again, most people are not funding a lot. That's, you know, is, you know, is what it is, but more is better. Um, one thing I would say on the pensions, listen, pension appropriations, that bill goes up every year with recent changes in the market and a move uh, to decrease, you know, the return assumption down to 7%. That's going to keep raising up that appropriation. And at least in the first quarter, um, according to Wilshire, pension funds were down 13.2%. Now, I would assume based on what's happened, they've come up quite a bit here in the second quarter. But, you know, listen, things go up and down every day. The key thing here is these things are going to need more money, and that money's going to come from you guys in terms of an appropriation bill you're going to get. So you're going to have ongoing strain. And I expect the legislature will probably have to extend the full funding date. Again, it's a legislative prediction. Take it for what it is. I have no insights. I have no, uh, no inside sources, I promise. But I expect that's probably going to happen because they're not going to have a choice. The budgets are just going to require it. With that said, I mean, most of you know me. Feel free to reach out at any time. I'll do what I can. But with that said, let me um, just give me one second here to pull up one thing here. All righty here. And I don't need to share my screen anymore. I'll let Kate and them get back to the important stuff. So, so the important stuff. So Kate is a senior consultant at PARS, Public Agency Retirement System. And Dennis Mullins is a senior portfolio manager at US Bank. For nearly 35 years, the PARS team has consulted with over a thousand public agencies, administering programs that have cumulatively saved hundreds of millions of dollars in public resources. They manage over five, I'm sorry, $4 billion in for over a thousand public agencies. I'm sure it'll be five before you know it. Specifically, they manage over $3.2 billion for over 400 OPEB accounts. So quite a bit of money, quite a few clients. Um, with that said, I will turn it over to Kate and Dennis and let them do all the magic. Uh, thank you for joining us today. I am Kate Canny. I work for Public Agency Retirement Services. Uh, some, of, some of you know me and we work together on uh, managing and administering your OPEB investment fund. So uh, PARS has been uh, working with public agencies since 1984. We're a leading provider of Section 115 combination trusts, uh, and it's one of the larger, fastest growing ones in the nation. Uh, as Parker just highlighted, as of June 2020, we have uh, $3.2 billion of assets in our OPEB only account. We also have a pension pre-funding trust as well, which we uh, work with with for over 425 clients. Uh, we pride ourselves on the structure of our program, uh, whereas we have a Section 115 trust, investment earnings remain tax exempt, and we provide a favorable private letter ruling, which we received um, in 2006 and then renewed in 2015, and a fully GASB compliant structure. And for those of you who may not remember what GASB compliant means is your OPEB funds are set aside and that they are dedicated to retiree health care only, uh, that they're protected from creditors, and they're irrevocable, but they're irrevocable for anything but health care costs for your retirees. Uh, we have a full uh, legal compliance monitoring group that makes sure that our program is fully compliant with the state and federal laws. Uh, we have a law firm that we work with in each state to make sure that any changes that come on the state level that our program is accountable for. And we have a very unique full service approach where we don't just provide you with investment advisory and investment management services, but we assist you with the full establishment of the trustee and custodial services. And we work with your um, program for complete compliance monitoring. Uh, so we have put together quite a field of partners in our PARS 115 trust team. PAR serves as the administrator and consultant. We can coordinate all the agency's services and activities, develop and manage full documents for the programs. As I said, we do all the full state and federal compliance monitoring and handle record keeping and reporting. And that includes uh, working with Parker and his team when it's time to 
put together your GASB fund reports. We've partnered uh, with US Bank. They serve as our trustee uh, and custodian for the funds and as an investment manager. US Bank is a fifth largest commercial bank, one of the largest trustees for Section 115 trusts in the nation. Uh, provides advisory and they serve as a co-fiduciary. So Dennis and his team not only are an investment advisor and a manager, but they're also maintaining that the assets that you're putting in your OPEB trust are held uh, within the best interests of your beneficiary. Uh, we manage, they manage our plans with both active and passive options. And as I said, are a trustee. And then we also have uh, Vanguard investment options as well. So PARS has uh, a OPEB combination trust where we provide two, uh, as we could say, buckets for your funds. We have the standard traditional OPEB investment option where you're able to pre-fund for your OPEB uh, retiree future costs. And we also have within the same stru trust structure that you may also set aside funds to offset ongoing costs and increases in costs for your pension. You're able to set aside funds so that you can offset maybe rising uh, requirements for uh, assessments and allocations. Uh, we're a one-stop shop where PARS provides uh, trust administration, consulting, fiduciary management, annual and audit, contribution, and consolidated uh, management with PARS. We also assist agencies in developing their funding plans, funding policies, and we work with their boards and whatnot. So I'm gonna turn over to Dennis, who's gonna to start to talk to you about the market and what he sees and what's going well, on. Um, the, the challenge today is talk about uh, where, what's been going on in the market, um, not only on a year-to-date basis, but also um, on a fiscal year-to-date basis. Your June 30 fiscal year is just about to come to a close. And, um, I'm going to touch on those things uh, over the next couple of slides. This uh, slide begins with just a graph of the S&P 500 on a year-to-date basis through the middle of last week. Uh, the market is so volatile that you just have to pick a date and, and put a pin in it and say, here's what we know so far. But you can see that as the year began through February 19th, the market was up 4.8% using the S&P 500. Then from February 19 through March 23, the S&P 500 fell 33.92% from peak to trough. That's a, an astonishingly high number um, over a very short period of time. So it appears as though the longest expansion on record um, was broken and then uh, maybe um, followed by the fastest recession on record, uh, depending on how things uh, fall. But we are setting records for volatility. We're, um, the market was down 6% the other day, and that is not the first time this year we've seen a, a move that big. And in an environment where um, we would like to achieve a discount rate of as high as 7%, seeing the market move 6% in a day is certainly unsettling. Then from March 23 through June 8, the market rallied 44.47%. Um, it's still down a little bit for the year. Remember, as you're linking together percentages, if you drop 50%, uh, you have to recover 100% to get back to where you started. So the fact that we had a 44% increase from the bottom on March 23, we're still down a little bit. Uh, but the market has been weak since then. Um, I actually updated this with June 11th numbers, um, and then the S&P was then down 7% uh, on a year-to-date basis. So where is the market? It depends on what day you look. And um, I, I wanted to put a, a, in some perspective um, to include some valuation perspective on this. And so I put a little chart on the left-hand side of this graph that shows – uh, a four-year string of earnings estimates for the S&P 500. A lot of data in this little chart, but I'll try to make sense of it. So for each year, we took a consensus of facts at Bloomberg and S&P Global Analysts and their estimates for the S&P 500 earnings. And on January 16, 
the estimates January 16 before anybody had really heard of COVID. Estimates were that in 2020, uh, earnings would rise about 11.3% from $158 to 175.7. So 11.3% increase this year in earnings was the consensus. That would put the market at 18.9 times 2020 estimates. So the PE price to next year's earnings was 18.9. Fast forward to May 10 and look at the same chart, you'll see that the, na the new estimate for earnings on the S&P 500 by the same group was $128.10. That's a drop of 20% over 2019 instead of an increase of 11.3% over 2019. And, um, and that put the market at a PE of 22. So uh, the point of this is that after the market fell, the market was more expensive because the market didn't fall nearly as much as the earnings estimates fell. So is the market cheap right now? No, not by any stretch of the imagination. Um, it's actually gotten a little more expensive than before. And this is one of the challenges of trying to figure out stock market valuations in a zero interest rate environment. Um, you can either invest in stocks and hope that they do well, or you can invest in bonds and know that they will not do well. There really is no alternative to equities. There's nowhere else to go with your investments that would clearly provide you with a better risk return trade-off than equities. Right now, if you invest in high quality long-term bonds, you are getting return free risk. And um, that's a very strange development. So that's where the market has been this year. It's for all practical purposes, almost flat, um, you know, down a little bit, but we're only halfway through the year. So Kate, if you go to the next slide, um, what has happened in response to that big drop in the market uh, we saw that began in February? We've seen uh, massive global bank stimulus from around the globe, not just the U.S. Central Bank, but also European Central Bank and Bank of Japan. We have um, right now we have 12 trillion dollars of debt uh, largely outside the U.S. that is actually um, debt with a negative yield. So we've got record low interest rates, but central banks have been very active. Uh, this central bank has adopted uh, modern monetary theory, which, um, which basically justifies record deficit spending and record borrowing. And um, we have a very active Fed in that they've gone into not only buying long-term treasury assets, but they are buying high yield ETFs. And that raises the question, are we going to see a Fed that's actually going to start buying stocks and start propping up the value of equities? Um, it sounds a little um, unusual to, to talk in those terms, but we've got a Fed right now buying high yield ETFs. So we're not that far away. So, the global central banks are all purchasing assets. They literally go out into the market and they buy long-term bonds. They buy their own long-term bonds from their own government in their own currency. And what that buying does, if you remember your relationships with long-term bonds or, or all bonds, when you buy them, you drive the prices up, which drives interest rates down. And this is how the Fed is doing two things. They're pushing long-term interest rates down to help provide fuel for economic recovery or economic activity. And in addition to that, they're ensuring liquidity. Uh, we had a few days earlier this year where it was hard to sell certain bonds. And the Fed stepped in and started providing um, a lot of liquidity by just buying lots of bonds out there. And so that it's a very effective strategy, this uh, concern about not being able to sell your bonds um, dissipated very quickly with this uh, very active Fed. These are open market activities. The other thing the Fed does, of course, is they set interest rates, monetary policy. And the Fed has basically indicated we're going to have 0% or very low interest rates for the next two years at least. 
Right now, the 30-year Treasury is at 1.41. The 10-year tre the Treasury is yielding 0 0.67, and the three-month Treasury is yielding 0 0.16. The Fed is only in direct control of that short-term rate, uh, and they have effectively set it at a range of 0 to 0 0.25. So, uh, the Fed is doing everything they can, and remember that these Fed actions are always very effective. Um, but they can't run forever. And so this kind of raises the question, we, we, we applaud and we, we pat the Fed on the back for helping save the economy. Uh, then we take a breather and we say, how is the Fed going to work their way out of this? And that will be a question that more people will be asking over the next couple of years. At the same time, Congress passed record stimulus, um, the CARES Act alone, um, record stimulus in providing direct paychecks to individual taxpayers, a $600 a month kicker to uh, unemployment benefits. Uh, we saw forgiveness or a deferment, I'm sorry, deferment um, uh, capabilities, uh, deferment options worked into certain mortgages. And of course, the Paycheck Protection Act, which provided direct loans to businesses that are forgivable if certain conditions are met. Um, again, very effective. And if you wonder how effective these are, just go back and look at that rally in the stock market. Um, this provided uh, confidence to investors that, okay, the, the economy is not going to collapse. Investments will be fine. And so s sentiment improved and investors went back in. And again, congratulations, you've temporarily solved the problem, but um, we're gonna have to work our way out of this in the long run. Okay, next slide, please. For those, um, almost all of you with the June 30 fiscal year, um, what's the outlook? Here's a, uh, there's a lot of data in here, but it really all kind of makes one point. Um, and that I've, I've uh, delineated down below. Um, as of May 31, the one-year return for the S&P 500 is 12.838, which is up near the top of this chart. S&P 500 for one year, 12.838, as of March 31, 2020. As we roll forward to the one year into June 30, we drop off the oldest month, which will be June of 2019. And in June of 2019, the S&P 500 was up 7%. So we're gonna lose 7% of that 12% return. And so that would leave us with five. So how the stock market did, I'm only looking at the stock market here, over that year into June 30, all depends on what happens in June of 2020. Right now, June of 2020 is down a little bit. Um, as of a few days ago, um, on a fiscal year to date basis, the S&P 500 was up 1.2% for that fiscal year to date. Uh, market has traded down a little bit uh, in the ensuing couple of days. It's probably down a little bit. But um, also look at the bond market up there. The Bloomberg, the very top line, Bloomberg Barclays U.S. Aggregate Bond Index for one year was up 9.5%. These are bonds that were yielding about 1, 1 1.5%, 2% maybe at best. And they're up 9.5%. That is because prevailing rates fell over that period. So most, um, if the market ended today, it looks like most investment portfolios might be in a position to be somewhere between uh, maybe break even at a median, um, anywhere from minus 5% to plus 5%, something in that range. And, and I'm saying that just by looking at one stock index and one bond index, but regardless of your allocation, um, it looks like stocks right now are on track to finish the fiscal year, June 30, um, close to even or flat over that one year period. Uh, bonds are going to be up and they're going to be up strong over that period. Again, um, nine and a half percent as of May 31. So um, that's a glimpse into your fiscal year outlook. Uh, next slide, Kate. So, you know, the, the question everyone, all of our clients are asking us is, what does the market do next? And um, in 
most stable periods of the market, we usually respond with, you know, that's tough to call. Um, this market is crazy. We're halfway through the year and we've seen all sorts of records um, as far as up market, down market, stimulus, um, central bank action. <clears throat> um, it's very difficult to say where the market's going to go. And keep in mind when you're always, when you're making a market forecast, um, one of the keys of course is over what period, because longer term market forecasts are more, are apt to be more accurate, but of less value. And shorter term forecasts are very difficult because right now, if you look at that market chart that I showed you for this year, um, that's not trading on fundamentals. That was trading on sentiment. Um, and, and we're still in that phase right now. We're tremendous volatility. Um, so in the short run, who knows where this market's going to go? Not only are we waiting to see if we're going to see a second wave of coronavirus and how bad will that be, but we're also waiting on some data to be able to really judge fundamentally where the market is. Um, right now, we don't have an awful lot of visibility into actual uh, GDP changes for Q2. And um, right, because we're still in Q2, um, we're just starting to get a handle on Q1. It looks like GDP was down about 5% in Q1. But, um, but again, real hard data is very hard to come by right now. So I broke down a couple of things into a basis for caution right now. Um, this is changing daily. We're seeing some increases in numbers of COVID cases in certain states. Uh, we're waiting to see if that's really an uh, increase in cases, uh, indicating increasing spread, or is that an increase in testing? Uh, America is starting to open up for business. Different states are at different points in their reopening. Um, I mentioned as the call was starting here, I flew last week, and um, from Ohio, where I sit, uh, the economy is probably a little more open than it was on the East Coast. Um, but it's an uneven reopening, um, and it still remains to be seen how fast the economy rebounds with the reopening. Earnings visibility is lacking. A lot of companies have suspended their guidance. Um, and don't forget, we have an election coming up. So uh, we expect very volatile markets between now and the end of the year. <clears throat> if you look at the basis for optimism, we have, as we head going into this, we have little to no inflation. We have interest rates almost set at zero, and that's very powerful uh, fuel for uh, business decisions. Um, Policy, um, you know, monetary stimulus and fiscal stimulus, I mentioned before, uh, these are um, always very powerful and um, very effective in moving the needle. And um, there are hopes of progress on a, on a vaccine. So um, it's a mixed bag right now. And Kato, if you'll go to the next slide, you know, where does that leave us? Um, as long-term investors, we are telling all of our clients right now, confirm your investment policy and confirm your asset allocation. It is important to point out that market volatility is not a reason to change your asset allocation. We are not short-term technical timers. And um, this year was a really good year to kind of drive that point home. Um, most investors became very conservative after the market fell, only to see the market rally almost back up to its previous highs quite unexpectedly. Uh, there were no signals that I'm aware of that called the bottom of the market. And as individuals, we, of course, have the ability to sell after the market goes down, but none of us really have 
a demonstrable ability to buy right before the market goes up or sell at the top. And so, um, you know, that's why we say once again, stay the course. Um, this is going to be a very uncomfortable year or two and there will be further developments, but, uh, in the long run, the stock market has given us about 10% a year. Our expectation is over the next 10 years or so, uh, it should give us somewhere in the uh, 7% range. That's a muted expectation compared to historical numbers. But as I mentioned before, with interest rates almost at 0% um, and inflation nowhere to be found, uh, it's the same roughly the same real uh, rate of return as we've seen historically out of the market. And with all of the other uncertainties out there, uh, the record deficit spending raising concerns of, you know, could there be inflation in the future? There could be, uh, but in, in an inflationary environment, stocks are usually the best investment. So, so all of that kind of comes back to the point that if you're very uncomfortable with what's happening with your investments, you should sit down with your advisor, review your investment policy, um, make sure you have the right asset allocation and investment strategy that provides the perfect balance of your objectives and your risk tolerance. And uh, that should be a conversation everybody is having with their, with their investment managers. Um, but we come back once again, as we almost always do, and we say stay the course. Don't try to time the market uh, because that's not going to be a profitable uh, strategy. So that concludes my comments. Um, Kate, I'll send it back to you. Okay. So um, I did include uh, one slide, Dennis, that actually just uh, provides a quick overview of the U.S. bank portfolios, if you wanted to touch on them and just uh, the, these are your portfolios and give any thoughts on maybe how what we've talked about today has impacted your management of your portfolios. What are you? Yeah, of course. Thank you. Um, so most, uh, most of the retiree health care plans that we manage are invested for very long-term periods. And we like to point out that long-term in that sense should be 20 to 30 years. Um, these are going to be long lived portfolios um, and they're going to be here for a very long time and the risk and return profile should really match that very long term time horizon. And that would lead you to what is shown in this chart as more of either the growth portfolio, which is about 70% in uh, equity investments with another 6% in real assets, which would be real estate and commodities. Um, or the balance portfolio, which is about 65% in real estate commodities and equities. Keep in mind in the long run, this in these portfolios, stocks are where you take your risk and that's where you make your return. Make sure that your uh, strategy that you're using is matched to the time horizon that you have for the portfolio. We do have some portfolios that we manage in the retiree healthcare field that are fairly conservative. Um, and while that may be necessary to, uh, to match the, the personalities of those who are overseeing the investments, uh, it's a bit of a mismatch if you've got a very long-term portfolio. So, um, so a variety of investment options to, um, to make sure that we have one that aligns with most, uh, most investors out there. But again, the, the key ingredient in your investment strategy um, really should be time horizon. These are very long-term investments. Hey, Kate, if you don't mind leaving this slide up, Dennis, yes. so one of the questions I come with all mm -hmm. my clients all the time is, again, to your point, this is long-term money. And again, as I always tell them, guys, I don't have to deal with your taxpayers, I'll deal with your select board, whatever but I encourage people to think more aggressively because ultimately that gets you the highest long-term rate of return over time. Obviously, right. March, not so much. April, phenomenal. Who knows? But if we're looking at this over the long-term, that's going to get us there. So kind of how do you, I know you just kind of talked about it a little bit, but maybe kind of describe even in the growth portfolio, what are over, again, a, you talked about a 7% long-term horizon, and that's probably about 
a growth portfolio is going to get you closer to that number. Say a balanced portfolio, and I'm always going to hold it to an exact number, but if you were saying over the long term, a balanced portfolio is worth X, an income portfolio is worth Y, you know, just ballpark back of the envelope kind of numbers. Sure. Um, you can very easily plug in expected returns to this asset allocation and come up with an expected return. Yep. So if, if you think the equity markets are going to give us 10% a year, which is what they've done historically, you can glance at that growth portfolio and you can say, I'm going to get 7% out of the equities. Yep. Um, right now, interest rates, which are almost at zero, fixed income yields, again, the 30-year treasury 1.41, the 10-year 0.67. Um, in most portfolios, we don't see any bonds out beyond 10 years. Yeah. So if you did as well as the 10-year treasury in your bond portfolio, that's less than 1%. Yeah. So, so that's a portfolio, a growth portfolio, you could look at it and say, best case scenario, I might get 7% out of that portfolio, long run. Yeah. Long run, right? Not in the individual year, but uh, over the next 10 years. Um, apply that same logic to the balance portfolio and you're looking at six. And so, um, again, in a non-inflationary environment, those aren't bad returns, but they're not the 10, 12, 14 that some investors have come to inspect or expect, um, you know, over, over, uh, over a bull market cycle. So, uh, probably lower than what we've seen in the past, uh, just because um, we've seen such a, a strong markets historically yeah. over the last 20, 30 years. You know, look at that income portfolio. It's about 50, 50. Uh, you're, you know, maybe 5% at most yeah. out of a portfolio like that. So you, you, you made a very good point. Um, that growth portfolio, we're, we're seeking a higher return. You're going to get greater volatility, which yeah. means you're going to have bigger losses when the market goes down. Um, I'll, most investors have come to understand that relationship, but that doesn't make it any easier when we're going through it. Well, fully understand that, especially when you get things like February, we drop 30% high to low in a month. As I joke to clients, we have the bull, the bear, and the bull all within about a three-week period. Um, speed bear market, you know, it's a little unusual. So, um, but yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a different mentality, but I think the thing, the difference there is, like you and me in our personal portfolios, these are towns, cities, school districts that have, you know, taxpayers to answer to. So it's a slightly different thing. They don't necessarily share the same long-term view. So it's always an educational process. So that's why I just, mm -hmm. I can ask you that to kind of help educate those folks about that. And, yeah, that's a good point. Um, and the other thing I would just tell folks who are on the line, I mean, one key thing is, I mean, as you know, Dennis mentioned, maybe your return this year is minus five, maybe it's plus five. The key thing I would tell you is that will have absolutely zero impact on your discount rate calculation beyond the actual asset number itself. If you show me your assets this year earned 32%, it wouldn't necessarily change my long-term rate of return assumption. If anything, it would probably make it less because I would say you've stolen from the future. If your long-term, if your this year is down five or down 10 or down 20, it's not gonna change my long-term rate of return assumption for next year. So don't get too hung up in the year to year. I know it. it's awful when it goes down and it's wonderful when it goes up, but this is long-term money as I just, I know I hammer that point home over and over again, but this is really long-term, you know, 20, 30 year money, not, this is not, you know, weekend vacation money. Um, so at least hopefully now we don't have that kind of a situation going on. Um, so no, um, let me just see here quickly. Um, I know we did a couple of polls here for folks. Um, again, people have not been changing their OPEB investment allocation, which is good to see. If anything, I would hope you would, those of you who are more conservative would, would see the value in realizing this is long-term money and at least talk to your advisor about maybe getting a little more aggressive. Again, I have no dog in the fight. I, my life goes on the same either way, but I think ultimately this is how you pay for the plan. If you're gonna have to contribute your way out of it, you're just not gonna have enough money. You need to get the market to help you. Um, we also saw that uh, you know, people have done okay on, you know, as far as how this has helped them over time. Um, you know, people are still working on getting town meetings done. So, uh, you know, definitely, I think just to share with you guys, you're not alone in what you're going through. Um, I know I'm gonna just launch another quick poll here about, you know, we always tell you guys, you know, again, very generous of, of Kate and Dennis to come on here and share their time and their expertise. I very much appreciate it. Um, I know you guys all have a lot of things to do on a Monday and taking the time. I, 
I truly appreciate it. And we know we appreciate the opportunity to serve you guys each and every day. And I know I speak for my team when I say that. Um, but again, there's, if there's things we can do in the future, if you guys have questions about Medicare buy-in, Medicare Advantage plans, what drives healthcare costs? I've been talking to Blue Cross about that. We're working uh, to see if we can get S&P on a webinar to try and help you guys about rating agencies. Whatever it is you guys think would be helpful, um, let us know. I mean, that's why we're here. We want to help you guys out. So if there's anything I can do to help, you know, either reach out to me separately or, you know, let us know here and we'll try and get the experts on. I don't proclaim to have all the answers. I mean, we've tried to get a member of Congress to, or a member of their staff, probably not them, to come on and talk about what's going on with the COVID-19 legislation in July. Um, so we're working on getting you guys those resources. Um, but again, if there's anything we can do, um, certainly let me know. Um, we've got the presentations are in the chat box. So if you want to download the presentations and go, what the heck was Dennis and Kate talking about? You can download the presentation. And I'll have all their contact information in there for you so you can reach out to them later. Um, and then say, Dennis, you told me I was going to get 7%. And then he will explain he did not say you would get 7 He said over the long term, you could expect to earn about 7 Very different answer. Um, those stats I shared with you on healthcare, those are in our presentation. Again, you're happy to download those. I'm happy to answer questions. Um, Kate, Dennis, anything you want to share before we let these people get back to their happy Monday? Well, uh, just thank you for joining and uh, good luck with your town meetings. I saw, I actually serve on my town's finance committee. We're getting ready to have our town meeting in about two weeks. So I see that most groups have not actually been able to have their town meeting. So good luck with that. And if there's any questions or um, information we could provide, please don't hesitate to co contact me or Dennis. Again, thank you again, everybody. We will uh, see you down the line. Again, if you have questions, reach out to any of us and we'll do whatever we can to help. Thank you again.